<laughs> so, please come on stage. So, as you all heard, my name is Hans Uskoreit. I've been working on AI for quite a while. Actually, I forgot for how long. Yeah, so, I cannot remember this. But for many, many years, for decades, we were sure that there would be eventually quite some impact. And not only by semantics, not only by machine learning, not only by large numbers of data, but actually the change would happen when these three things come together. That's the explosive mixture. Yeah? So that will be, bring about probably much more change even than we can imagine at this point. But let's see if we agree on this question. And whenever we talk about this at uh, meetings, then we are asked by journalists, mainly by journalists, yeah? mainly by journalists from the humanities and social sciences. We are asked, what you are saying will have devastating effects on society, on the labor market, on the future of human labor. And of course it may, and it's not that we are not thinking about it, we are thinking about it quite a bit, but we need to think about it all together. Unfortunately, most of the people who ask me don't have the faintest idea about what is actually killing the jobs. Yeah? So they are just thinking there's something coming and it will take away the jobs, automation will come very, very fast. So I won't say anything about my uh, own work because actually I was asked to fill in for an open speaking slot in the afternoon and whoever is interested can come and uh, look what we are doing. So I'm not saying much more. I've worked on many areas of AI, mainly language analytics, text analytics, combining it with uh, data analytics and also machine learning. But now I have a great panel together here, fortunately today. There's Nima Asgari, Asgari uh, from uh, actually Osnabrück, from uh, Drone Industry Insights, who not only has worked on completely different types of autonomous systems, but also he has thought quite a bit about what machine learning can lead to. Yeah? What are the jumps? Uh, what are the interruptions that it can lead to. So I'm very glad to have you here. Give him a hand of applause and then... <laughs> the next is Michael Bohmeyer. Actually, Germans may know him because he was got into the press quite a while ago by starting one... He's an entrepreneur anyway, yeah, close to Berlin, but he got into the press recently by starting um, I, an, an initiative, hopefully you're going to say a little more about it, namely try out basic income. Just try it out on a small scale and he will tell you. And, and this way is a little different from the Silicon Valley experiments and he will talk about it. And then we have Abdu, Abdurrahmane Fai uh, from SAP. No, from no, HPE. From HP, oh, sorry, from HP, of course. Yeah, from <laughs> HP. <laughs> But SAP is not so wrong, right? Yeah, right. I remember your name because yeah. we are working with SAP. Yes, <laughs> so I, was, I remember yes. you from the... So we worked with SAP and that's why I fell back into this trap now. Yeah? SAP is one of the shareholder companies of my research institute. Yeah? So I, I still see you as a close ally, but now you are only a friend. Yeah. <laughs> so and yeah. so um, uh, Abdu is at the forefront of thinking through what actually advanced data analytics can do for businesses. Yeah? And, and, and he has thought quite... So he is, on the one hand, working on this machine learning data analytics, business analytics, but then translating it into the conversions and the changes it can do. So I'm very... Is that right? So that's why I'm very happy to have you here too. Thank you. So now I think we should make... No, I, I say one or two more things about the topic and then uh, let the people um, uh, introduce themselves. So I already said it. Uh, we believe uh, that there's more of change to come. How fast is it going to come? We don't know. Is it only to kill jobs or to create new jobs? We have to discuss it here. We may have different opinions. Recently, we had an AI conference here in Berlin, not far from here, with many famous people of AI uh, came together, and one of the inventors of LSTMs, one of these deep learning, one of these architectures for deep learning neural networks, Schmidt Huber was asked on stage, but your robots will kill all these jobs. And Schmidt Huber replied, I checked all the countries and ordered them by the number of robots they have 
already in practice installed. Those are the countries with the smallest unemployment numbers. What are you talking about? And this is something that we should think about. This may not stay that way, and we have to think whether we see, is it really true that more robots lead to more jobs, or does, do they kill them? And maybe this is a good way to start with Nima, yeah, yeah. because he has thought about it quite a while. Can you introduce yourself and maybe sure. already say what do you think about this? Uh, yeah, so happy to be here. Um, I initially started as a guy who built robots and drones, and then uh, I prematurely entered the young drone market. It's like only four or five years old, the commercial drone market, and uh, advanced to uh, working on autonomy, and then at a point I was like, our developers were much better than me at programming, so I got into management and uh, consulting and uh, high-level uh, strategy. And now with Drone Industry Insights, we're supposed to know everything about drones, a little bit robotics also. And drones are really interesting uh, from my point of view because they're not like cars to autonomous cars kind of transition. They're building a whole new stack and system that could be driverless from the start. And that means a great deal. Uh, we're just in the beginning of this new era, uh, but it's probably a very good uh, place to look at the potential future for all the other industries which are old and transitioning to new uh, automation-dominated uh, uh, methods. Um, regarding your question, I, I think in short term, uh, automation and robots and AI, uh, they're quite like um, offshoring, but instead of offshoring to other countries, you, in fact, you bring jobs back to your own country. That's probably one reason for why you said uh, um, countries which are high tech, they actually have lower unemployment. Um, however, this is probably a, a short term or like probably 10, 20 year transition that will eventually lead to, we have all kinds of numbers about like how much of the society is vulnerable to automation, but eventually it will lead to uh, complete offshoring to the digital world or to their embodiments as physical robots. Uh, so I'm very optimistic in short term. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, for robots to be leveraged to increase productivity. But it's a complete different story when you move towards singularity and when robots become almost as good as we are in specialized skills, uh, then everything really changes. So we really, I think when we talk about uh, jobs and automation, we have to divide it to this short-term period and then the long-term discussions, which really goes into the direction of sci-fi. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, so, so there were two very interesting points addressed that we should, many more, but two that we should pick up on. One, the prediction that right now it may be that actually we are creating more jobs than are killed, yeah? so in the, in the short time. But if you really believe either in singularity or cl close to human or even superhuman capabilities of AI, then of course, it is inevitable that the labor market will change completely. And we should come back to this, to the, to the, to the there are three hypotheses, actually. One is, uh, it, it won't change much. Yeah? It will always create more, jo more jobs than it will kill. The second one is, right now it's creating more jobs, but in the longer run, yeah, uh, labor change market changes, and we have to concentrate on jobs that are very highly skilled. And then the third is, with the singularity and superhuman performance, why are humans needed at all? <laughs> so, but let's first, let's not go to the third right away. Yeah? So let's proceed then in, in, in terms. Now, uh, uh, Michael, if you could say a little bit about your initiative, but maybe not too much, because I think before we really touch, um, uh, go deeper into uh, universal basic, basic income or unconditional basic income, uh, and the mechanisms, we should discuss at least a little more how we agree or disagree on the need for that. Yeah? But maybe you can say already what you did. Yeah, uh, yeah. hi everyone. Um, so when we're talking about jobs and the automation, we always think, oh my god, our jobs are gonna go. And it's, it's a discussion driven by fear, and that obviously comes from the fact that we all need a, an income so that we can live in the society. 
And basic income is the idea to rethink this concept and say, okay, everyone needs money in this world, so let's give them the money free of conditions, no strings attached, and then they can decide what they do and maybe earn more by working if there's still some work for them to do. And also, by the way, we always have to think the fact that there's much more work out there than it's actually paid. Out of 10 Germans, only four today have a, a regular job that is paid for. The other 60% of all working hours are not being paid for, and those are the ones that keep the society together. Um, what I did is I received my own basic income from a company that I started 10 years ago and which is now going by itself, and I'm receiving a, a little um, profit uh, from it every year, and I pay it out to myself as a basic income of around 1,000 euros a month. That I started two years ago, and it changed my life dramatically. Um, everything turned out to be better. I work more, <laughs> but I live healthier. I'm a better father. And um, yeah, I started to develop a creativity that I didn't have before. And so I thought, that's crazy. That's a crazy effect. I, I had less money, too. Um, so would that work with everyone else, too? And I thought, okay, um, I, I don't know. Uh, let's give it a try. So I started a crowdfunding, and I collected money. And once I had 12,000 euros uh, together, I wanted to raffle it out to anyone. Uh, and, and pick a randomly selected person on our website. And we did that, and it was a total success, and we already have crowdfunded 60 basic incomes for, for 60 people. And, um, yeah, we've been doing this for two years. We have 350,000 people on our website. It's called meingrundeinkommen.de, so my mm -hmm. basic income. You can Google it. And it's, it's gotten huge media attention because, obviously, basic income is, is a topic of our times. Yes. And yeah, yeah thank we you. We will ask you later more about the first tent experience because we are, I think most of you have read about experiments with basic income in Canada a long time ago. Uh, now, the uh, Combinator Y project, the UBI project in the Silicon Valley, we will say something, who give money to 100 Oakland families. But all of these things are neither really evaluated very well, like in the Canadian case, or in the Oakland case, I have not read any first-hand experience uh, uh, reports, so it would be very nice if you could come later and connect. But as I said before, let's talk a little bit more about these drastic changes yeah, that are ahead of us. And you are looking in the effects of machine learning, uh, AI, uh, new data-driven analytics technologies for business. Do you share the optimism or the pessimism? Yeah? What, what will happen to the jobs? Well, this is a very old question, in fact, really. Because when I saw your topic here, it reminded me um, a few years ago, when I, in the end of 98, if I remember well, when I was completing my PhD in machine learning and data mining, I was looking for some data uh, in the time of expert, expert systems, rule-based system, for people not familiar with it, that were helping, for example, doctors to make the right decision whenever some, some new diseases are coming based on some facts. So when I was discussing with some doctors at the time, they were saying, wow, what do you want to do, Abdul, with that? You want to replace us as doctors, so we lose our job. I said, no, it's not really the topic. We are here to help you, to provide you with tools that can empower you as potential users of it and bring additional value to you, but not replace you in any case. To come back to the question today, the same question is coming again, again, and again, and I think we'll always have it. Uh, now, am I optimistic or not? Yes, I am. I'm absolutely optimistic because uh, I think that human can has some brain. And as far as you have some brain, we can reinvent things. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm optimistic. So you think whatever the turn and the speed of the changes are, humanity, human society will have some, maybe a little delayed, but some reaction to it, yeah? And in the end, it will work out for the better. But if you had to make, based on your experience now, um, a suggestion, will it stay that way, that automation, uh, the digital society, digital transformation, AI, in the end will always create many more jobs? Or will there come the time when actually the disappearance yeah, of today's human labor will be much, much larger, and we have to think of drastic new ideas. Is that what do you think? For me, 
yeah, it's quite difficult because we don't have really some statistics about comparing what was dropped with what we created. Obviously, the digital economy, in particular the automation of all the process, business process, and everything that is involved around automation is creating new jobs, but at the same time it's dropping some jobs. What I do believe is that the drop jobs or people concerned with the drop jobs may have other way to embrace additional and new things, new jobs. And this is why I think that we will certainly be more creative. Yes. So we I mean? need new forms of labor, yes. but, but then the financing of these jobs would be different uh, if we had some kind of a basic level income so that these jobs only create additional value, yeah? So we'll come, <laughs> that yeah, will be yeah. later, yeah? yeah so yeah. We'll if you help to economically create new types of labor or if they have to be economically self-sustainable. That's mm. quite different, yeah? So then, so, but that, that's, I think, will be one of the major questions. But before, now, you, we, we checked you out on, 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 on your uh, forecast and Nima worked quite a bit, he looked quite a bit into questions of singularity, so you all know what's behind it. Many, many very smart people in business, in science, believe that this is more than just a faint possibility, that actually machine learning will come to that point. Do you think this is something we have to worry about in our lifetime or later? And how fast do we have to prepare? Do we still have time or should we already prepare? What's your yeah. idea? So I think AI and software or IT industry 4.0, whatever you might call it, there they have different labels, but at the end, the kind of compound effect is quite similar. The way they increase productivity, but at the same time, you have this productivity paradox that, okay, it's, people should become more productive, but at a point, it kind of separates. We become, we do not really have the capacity to keep up with the productivity increase that comes from automation. So we are staying at this level because of the speed that biological evolution you know, takes to make us better. But then machines are constantly improving, even if with a very tiny amount of acceleration. I think uh, uh, kind of if we zoom out, a good way to look at it from like a philosopher's point of view is the um, first industrial revolution, the steam engine, what it did was it created a substitution or a way of augmenting our muscles. So we're not anymore uh, training people to become super strong and compete with uh, bulldozers or with cranes, right? Uh, and that was fine. Why? Because the reason we differentiate ourselves as a species on this planet is not because we're stronger or faster or bigger, it's because of our brains. It's because of the mind. If you're not a dualist and think we have a spirit or we're special, let's say we have our brains, that's what uh, makes us smarter and better than all the other species. So what is this uh, in, in terms of uh, this second machine age book from Bren Yolfson, uh, the MIT guys? This second machine age, the IT revolution or the computer revolution, it's targeting our brains. And we are living in these really special times for us, it feels like, okay, our cell phones are getting a little bit cheaper, smaller, faster, but at the end, they're also becoming smarter. It doesn't really matter if they become smarter with Moore's Law or half that or double mm -hmm. that. At the end, we should look at this fundamental question that uh, the second machine age, the IT revolution, AI, whatever we want to call it, it's going for our only differentiation on this planet. So we are going to have competition and it doesn't really matter if they are the same way we are. They do not really need to be generally intelligent or AGI. They just need to be good in doing things that we're paid for. And th that's another interesting perspective that we think, okay, this robot video is so stupid, it can't even walk or fold clothes. But who cares? If it's very good at doing one job or even part of one job, that's enough for the company to pay one-tenth to that AI 
or to the server or whoever owns it rather than paying you 10x. So we don't really need robots to be as good as humans in yes. everything. We just need them to be good enough for the things that we're paid for. Yes. That is a very important insight, by the way, that I don't know if you have heard it shared with already, but I think all of you have thought about it, or you have heard about it. Uh, it doesn't really matter for the labor question so much whether we would have real general AI or not. Why? Because there is no job, almost no, no individual uh, um, um, exercise, activity yeah, in jobs that requires all of, all of it. If we can, without having real AI, beat the grandmaster in Go and the world champion in chess and the quiz masters in Jeopardy and be uh, faster and better in robotics in the company, that's enough. It doesn't, it doesn't really, for our question here, I would say that's an interesting philosophical question, and not just philosophical, it may be existential for our society, whether there will be singularity or not. But for our debate, let's put it aside now and come back to the question of how we react, right. because even if we don't have it, yeah, it is already enough yeah, what the machines will be able to do without general AI, just to be specialized for certain things very well, uh, and, and, and that will already take care of many, many of these jobs. Yeah? So, in, in your case, if we come back to, to Michael now at this point, because that fits very well, is, so universal basic income, would it only help as a soothing factor, so that then people can do gardening and reading and writing poems, or is there anything in society, can these people with a universal basic income still be functioning and helping other people as well, or only helping themselves? What is your idea? Well, it depends on uh, what kind of image you have of the human being, and I would say the human is a social being, and is always interested in interaction with others and helping others. Um, and I suppose people would still pretty much want to do the same thing. Um, we did research on this question. Yeah. Would you keep on working if you had a basic income? Oh, there has, have been many researchers on that. Over 90% say, of course, I would stay in my job, or I, I would at least keep on working. Maybe I would like to have different working conditions. Maybe I would start something new. But um, there's always this general fear the economy would break down. But yes, uh, there seems the... to be no evidence. Also, there's no evidence in this with our 60 people who have received the basic income. Uh, they all kept on working except one person who used to work in a call center. <laughs> okay. so, and, and that's an important Tell thing. Tell you more about call centers than about the person, you think? Uh, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Because we already have this competition between um, machine labor and human labor today. Yeah. But um, like autumn like digitalization is not coming on as fast as it could be because we don't have a basic income yet. What we have in Germany is the, a, a huge uh, low-income labor market, the biggest one in Europe, and because we have that, we don't have machines yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, do, you don't buy a robot yeah. um, when the wages of your employees are so low, just like the steam engine. Um, it wasn't introduced uh, in the factories after it was invented. It has already been there. But when the wages in England were so high that it was, uh, you could make a profit from using robots, um, um, steam engines back in the days, then they started using them. Yeah. And it's the same effect with basic income, I suppose. Thank you. So now, before we ask the audience, let's see if we all agree. You would agree also that, I mean, just short answer, yes or no, or... Or, uh, I, I had a comment, actually. To a comment Michael. to that. Yeah, please make it. No, um, I know that. I mean, I, one, one big flaw that I see, and I'm, I'm not the only one who thinks this way, in all these UBI experiments is that they are for a limited period of time. So they're sort of one year, two year. But it's very different if somebody yeah. tells me, oh, you're going to be paid for the rest of your life. Yeah. If somebody tells me, OK, for the next two years, you're in some experiment, I look at it as some kind of lottery, that I was lucky, I got some money, but then the long-term effects of a society who has no deadline, who has a lot of national pro pro procrastinators with no goals, is really dangerous. I mean, it's, it's yeah. probably the only way to keep 95% of humanity alive, but 
uh, I think we could even call, we have to talk about more, but it's not really uh, universal basic income, it's universal miserable income of $1,000 or euro. I see. Yes. Okay, here we already heard one, there are many counter arguments, as you all know. It's the, uh, the basic income is actually too low to get people happy, or needs are different, or people will get lazy and not work anymore, or the, uh, uh, it will be such a change, it can wreck everything and we cannot rebuild it. And then there's another one that we may come to at the end, but not now yet, and this is globally. We know the refugee situation. What will happen globally if one country introduces it? Yeah? So there's lots of these questions, but before, Abdu, what do you think? Is, well, is that a good idea, UBI? For me, uh, coming from Switzerland, where it was rejected, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we have a votation in yes, June sir. in Switzerland where we completely rejected that. But for me, addressing the unemployment question, unemployment due to automation, by putting in place a UBI system, for me, is not the right response. Yes. Uh, it's not the right response. Re UBI is not the right response. Yes, okay. for me. That's my personal opinion. I, I believe that we need to reinvent new things, and we can do it. The automation yeah. is creating a lot of opportunities. Yes. It's creating it, dropping jobs, of course, but it's also creating a lot of um, uh, opportunities. And this is where we need to focus, really. How can we balance? The opportunities, tons of opportunities creating compared to what it is dropping down. Yeah. And so then which, I think we can find the yeah. way. But the which right of way the counter arguments against UBI weighs strongest in your opinion? What's the strongest counter arguments? Because you say you, you're not really <laughs> subscribing to it. So what's the, is it the effect on people yeah, uh, or is it more? Uh, it's a lot of things really. It's a lot of things all together. The I fact see. that okay. I'm not, I don't believe that saying to all of to, to, to yeah. a country that if you don't have a job, you will have a fixed revenue, all the rest of their life will motivate people to really yeah. to, to, to do will something it, else. Will it, motivate you? Again. <laughs> would it motivate you? Would you keep on working with the basic income? Uh, well, it is not, it, for me personally, it's not what would motivate me really, personally, yeah. because I believe that I need to do something, yes. I need not to rely on what I'm getting without doing nothing. Is that the it same for you, everyone? Yeah. <laughs> but it would not demotivate you. Now let's yeah, see. Absolutely. Let's first, I mean, if we have support for UBI, that's easy, but who has a good reason against it? So who would be strongly against it, has a very good reason? Anybody? Just brief, some argument against? Three people? Yeah, there. Okay, please. There are two people. The first the uh, one in front and then the second. Yeah. Uh, what's the, your main argument? Uh, my main argument is that I haven't seen a macroeconomic model that really uh, can convince me that uh, the flow of money and goods can be uh, maintained when everybody or when a certain share of people yeah. stops working. That's uh, an argument. So they, they estimated three trillion, I think, for the United States, and they. There are some people who think it can be done and others think there's no way and the majority now of the economists is in the middle somewhere. And what was your argument? Hello? Yes. Fear of inflation, that's it. I see, okay, yeah, so the whole economy, uh, yes please, we have also an Yeah, they okay. They don't they have a different background, a less educated background, and then they're not creative as yeah, we are to like find uh, something to do in life. So the majority of people might not be self-driven, self-motivated enough, but they need this kind of organized yeah, uh, place in, to be helpful in society. And why? Now, like would you, <laughs> you, 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 you should now <laughs> advocate and say something about it, and, uh, because you are the main pro, uh, proponent, yeah? and then I can also add. Yeah, but. yeah so I got one minute. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I think we, 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 everybody exceeds for one or two minutes. So, so um, this is an like interesting question. Yeah. How to finance basic income? Well, it is a tough question, and there are tons of different models of basic income out there, reaching from 400 euros a month up to 1,500 euros a month. Um, all parties in the parliament have concepts um, of a basic income, and there are different models of how to finance it by different kinds of taxes. 
Um, it's not, I'm not an expert in this, and I don't think this is the real discussion. I think the real discussion is what I heard in your question. Do we trust other people that they are kind of like me, that I want to do something in my life, I want to achieve things, and I, I want to work? Or are they all lazy, as the society tells us today? Um, we just have to make this decision, so um, I think first we have to have a discussion if we want basic income, and then we'll find a way of financing it. Um, this is a process, and it starts today. Um, the other thing is with the inflation. Um, basic income is not more money adding to the system. In this case, obviously, there would be inflation and the basic income would be gone. Um, basic income is the idea to make the lower 1,000 euros of the money you already, most of us have today, is free of conditions. You just get it because you're a hum human being. So there's not more, system added, not, not more money added to the system, it's just redistributed. Um, yeah. And uh, considering your question, like, I guess we have to talk in person. This is, this is the main question of basic income. Basic income is a new model of organizing society. It's not a, a society driven by controlling others, mistrusting other people, um, not a society driven by numbers. It's, it's a society of letting control go, of empowering other people and trusting in them and, and say, okay, I want to work, you want to work, everyone in this room wants to work. How are the other people? Who are the other people? How are they different from us? Like, why do we think that we are better and we want to work and they don't? Let's talk about it. Let's look at the numbers because there's no proof for it. If you have a proof, please send it to me. I've, yes. I've been looking for this. So that's the, yeah. this, this, the question we have to pose yeah. ourselves. What would I do if I had a basic income? And then ask your friends. Yes, there are two more. Uh, we have time for one or two more organizers. Yeah, we, we simply do it. Disobedient. Yeah, I'm just, I just don't get the idea. Why should I be happy with the 1,000 euros a month? I pay for my kids 600 uh, for for the kin kindergarten. I'm I'm just don't care why. Don't understand why I should have less fear with this basic income. Yeah. Yeah, I think proponents would say that gives you the possibility to work in addition, but you can more freely pick the type of stuff and maybe do more what you like than what gives you, pays you enough for your paying all your bills. That's one of the... Uh, and if you want to be happy, that's still your own decision, <laughs> but your kids would also get a basic income. Yeah. And what we've noticed in our experiment, if, if people know I'm secure, I cannot go be below a thousand euros, even if they had a lot of money, yeah. much money before, it gives you a different feeling. You Give can try. convince <laughs> your kid not to spend it them on chewing gum and so on. Give it to, <laughs> so it's, there was it's another... Very easy. There, was, there was another... Uh, was there's the microphone. Please use the microphone. I have a slightly different way of thinking about it. So any quantity that you can measure in a quantized way is just making a relative comparison. So when everyone has, let's say, a thousand bucks, you are just resetting the value of zero. Yeah. It does not change anything in the whole situation. Um, okay. That relates to the same point as the inflation. So, thousand bucks become worthless when everyone has thousand. Can I maybe... Yeah. Uh, the, probably all the Clarify. people here, you're not like super poor or you're, you have some education, you have a job. The, the issue with current kind of safety nets for the people who are... Uh, they don't have the same possibilities, opportunities as we have, is that the social safety net is like a ceiling, it's not like a floor. So you have to stay poor, and if you make more than a certain amount, you lose your current safety net. Uh, but this idea of basic income, what, where I see merit, is that it gives you some kind of cushion. It gives you this floor that at least you're not going to die from hunger. But it's not going to make your, you ordinary people's lives better. Then I, then I would like to provide resources in a controlled way and not give the freedom in the, well, in the way of money that you can control where you spend it. Uh -huh. So I would like to balance the opportunities equally, not, I mean, that, you can go and spend it on drugs. That, that's the way it is done now in US, for example, but it's very inefficient and at the end, uh, the argument is that one dollar of UBI is one dollar, but one dollar of these safety net money or welfare is not really one dollar. It doesn't go to everyone. It's very inefficient. Of course, yeah. you have to constantly reevaluate what means balancing the opportunities. Yeah. Because this changes 
every five years yeah. or ten years. And, and here the idea sure. is that if you have this base level, then you free people. Nobody has to think of it anymore. If somebody wants to do another education, he simply does it. Yeah, whether you are in the middle, in the higher income, in the lower, in the higher income, you never have to worry. They have enough savings, but uh, you 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 have some freedom. And but let let me do one thing. So because I see already, this is now one of the interesting things that, for instance, the committee of the Deutsche Bundestag didn't stop finishing during its sessions. Yeah, because they run out of time and we will run out of time. Let me do one thing. In the 11th of November there will be a conference in Berlin called uh, Vision Summit and uh, uh, Mohammed Yunus, the Nobel Prize winner and many people will come together and discuss some social change questions and one workshop will actually be on global universal income. Yeah? So I would like now before we uh, uh, part here at this interesting point, but all these discussions finish. It's like a good party, it finishes when it's best. So, um, all, all, let, before you all go away, let me see, and, and nobody will take notes, yeah? You can raise your hands if you like or not, yeah? But please do if you have an opinion. Who thinks, first of all, that not global, but in one society, in an advanced society, some uh, UBI should be tried, at least try it as an experiment? So, oh, that's a majority. That's a clear majority. Yeah. So, it's a, so okay. Not, not, not. So, I would say about two thirds. Was it about? Yeah. Would you? More. Actually. More than two thirds. Mm -hmm. Who thinks that the same thing can be true globally? I mean, think about it. How many economically that is feasible globally? Because it may be. That's a very. It's it, it's a very stern and a very courageous yeah, thing to work for. But who thinks that? global universal income should be worked for. Yeah? No, not right now, but work towards, should work towards. Yeah? Me, okay, that's, uh, that's less than a third, right? That, less than a third. That's a very interesting thing. We should take it to that, uh, because I will make sure that, the, that this, uh, at least as a, as a spark, because these people are very interested in groups like this. The people who are meeting there is mainly social scientists, social workers, people working on social change. And I think they will be really interested in, in, in hearing about our discussion. So thanks to all of you for your attention and especially thanks to the panelists for their very good participation and contribution. Thank you. Thank you.